תכף שאכל התפוח, נפל בחטפו שינה, והיה ישן זמן מרובה מאוד, והיה המשרת מנער אותו, ולא היה נאור כלל. אחר כך הקיץ משנתו, ושאל את המשרת, איכה... I want to welcome everybody that is here today. We are live right now with Rabbi Lazer Brody, who will be giving his weekly class today for the Lighthouse Torah Project. And uh, I just want to uh, welcome everybody that's still joining here in the group right now. Rabbi Brody has just been unmuted. Oh, okay. <laughs> welcome aboard, Rabbi. How are you? Uh, lovely, lovely, and especially the Simcha, and I'm so, in a minute, I'm going to tell you why I'm in Simcha, okay, because you see, this is my, this is my, my flute, my Eretz Yisrael flute, and it's made out of reed, out of cane that came from an Eretz Yisrael river, and Moses used to play the same flute, the Gemara Arachim says it, I haven't touched this for a year, because I have been in mourning for my mother. Uh, the morning for my mother, the year of mourning ended in Israel a half hour ago. But it's still my mother's first year at site, the second of Tammuz. Already in Israel, it's the third of Tammuz, another special year at site, Lubav Cherebin. So just whatever a ship puts in the flute, whatever a ship puts in the flute, then this is what we're gonna play. the Shiloh Nigun, and where I get that Nigun from, that's the Nigun that came to the flute. That Nigun, when I went to Mishkan Shiloh, which is in, uh, between Judea and Samaria, when I went to Mishkan Shiloh, and I went in the caves where the Kohanim used to live, it's before the Holy Temple was moved, was built in Jerusalem, the tabernacle was in Shiloh, and at the time of Samuel the prophet, Okay, and uh, Ali afterward, and um, at the, they still have, it's, it's something amazing. You can still see where the Mishkan was. It is such a moving place. And I went inside the caves where the Kohanim used to live, the priests used to live, and had my flute with me, and that's what came out. That's where we go. Uh, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov says that all of Eretz Yisrael has its own Nigun. That wherever you go in Eretz Yisrael, you can hear the Nigun. If somebody's really spiritual and touch, uh, they, can, they can hear the Nigun, they can hear the Nigun of, of the north, the south, the Galilee, the, 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 sea, of, the, the sea of Galilee, the, the, the Dead Sea, everywhere. Beautiful. Okay. Rabbi, when I go, when I, when I'd like to go over tonight's also generous sponsors that sponsored today's class. Terrific. Um, today's sponsor is from Shulamit Shield. And Rafua Shlema for Mazel Tov Matilda Bat Rachel, and also in Rafua Shlema Harab Ishayahu Yosef Pintu Pinto Ben Harabanit Zachari Shlita, and also as well as Priscilla Estrella in memory of, I'm sorry, in memory in in uh, the healing and for the teshuva of Jeremy Bat Priscilla. And also, these classes are always in memory of Deborah Fega Bat Shmuel Zichron and Menachem Mendel Ben Alhanan. After we're done with the class, we'll go over again with the question and answers. Thank you very much. Okay, for sure. I'm going to speak for about uh, three quarters of an hour, and uh, afterward, whatever questions, prepare your questions. If you have a question, I suggest that on the chat, on the Zoom chat, you flash it over to Michael. Okay, and in addition to the dedications for 
Chasia Bas Gamliel Alevi, my beloved mother, that left the, left the world a, a year ago, Bo Hashem, that uh, it should be really, we don't have to dedicate to our parents because everything we do automatically goes to our parents. And that's one of the mitzvahs that we do, not only in lifetime, but after lifetime. Uh, even our parents are not in the physical world, we still honor them. The, the mitzvah of honoring your mother and your father, they, could, they continue. Uh, today we've got a special lesson it's called Water from the Rock. It's based on a passage in this week's Parsha, okay, where Hashem tells Moses to speak to the rock, and Moses he made a mistake. We'll see what soon he did. He'd be, instead of speaking to the rock, he hit the rock. But Moses, before, he was in the same situation. Hashem told him to hit the rock. But this time, Hashem told him to speak to the rock. So it's, it's understandable. If, uh, as Moses' defense attorney, there's a million ways to defend Moses. Uh, what does Hashem say to Moses? Moses says, because you didn't believe in me enough to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. This is passage number 12 and chapter 20 of uh, the book of Numbers. The Chubash Bamibal. So Hashem informs Moses, it's a tough punishment. Hashem mo informs Moses that he won't be allowed to enter the land of Israel does not be allowed to enter then. So I mean, we know that even if maybe we can't come to the land of Israel, I mean, well, because of our, our circumstances, we've got Parnassa and in in, in outside of Israel. We've got elderly parents outside of Israel. We've got all types of extenuating circumstances. Some people are in second marriage and they have joint custody of their children for first marriage and they just can't pick up and leave. But it's a big difference that you could pray to Hashem, Hashem, bring me to the land of Israel. And you can pray to Hashem, Hashem put me on a plane, Hashem, at the extenuating circumstances, you can fix them up in a minute. But for someone to tell you, no, you cannot come to the land of Israel, it's devastating. For a Jew to hear something like it's devastating. And for Moses, Moses' whole being, he wanted to be in the land of Israel because Moses attained the 49th level of wisdom. There's one level, one more level, 50. And that was attainable in the land of Israel. Plus which Moses wanted, not just theoretically, to learn about the, the various mitzvahs. He wanted to practice them. And there are many mitzvahs that we spoke last week that you can only do in the land of Israel, such as the mitzvahs of, uh, of eating fruits and vegetables and kashers. Okay, so Hashem informs Moses that he's going to be punished and he's got to be allowed in the land of Israel. And Hashem is explicit. He says, Moses, you're not going to be allowed into the land of Israel because of your lack of amuna." And you missed a once in a lifetime opportunity to sanctify Hashem's holy name in front of all of Israel. Oh, did Moses a lack of a Muna? What can we say? Moses a lack of a Muna. Hashem tells Moses he lacks of a Muna. How can it be possible? And what did Moses do that was so terrible? And why did Hashem give him such a stiff punishment? Okay, we're now at court, within the heavenly court, and I'm taking on my. My uh, job is defending Moses. I'm going to defend Moses, okay? So after the children of Israel complained about the lack of water in the desert, Hashem showed Moses a rock. He says, Moses, see that rock there? See that rock? Go speak to that rock. See that great big rock? Go speak to it. And Hashem promised Moses, if you talk to that rock, water is going to come gushing out. Okay, so... Uh, People complained they didn't have what to drink. They didn't have what to drink. Their cattle didn't have anything to drink. And they're all complaining. Now, who's complaining? You've got 600,000 men with women and children, 2 million people gathering around Moses, and they're all yelling at him, and they're all complaining. Why did you take us out of Egypt and to, to, to die of thirst in the desert? Now, let me ask you something. Beloved brothers and sisters, have you ever tried to accomplish something when somebody's yelling at you? Okay, and it's virtually impossible. Imagine, you know, you're at work and your boss is yelling at you. Come on, hey, Mr. Boss, nobody can function when they're being yelled at. Don't, 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 you do your do tone down. Now, let's not forget that hundreds of thousands of men were yelling at Moses with women and children, and it, it, you're talking about over two million people. Why don't you take us out of Egypt? And you're there. It was bad enough when people are scolding us for something we did do. Okay, so you made a mistake. All right, and now you're being scolded for making a mistake. But they're blaming Moses for something Moses didn't do. Moses took him out of Egypt. Hashem took him out of Egypt. Okay, 
So it, 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 it bad enough when we're being blamed for something we did do. How do you feel when a person is yelling at you for something you didn't do, you're falsely accused? That's a terrible feeling. And you've got not hundreds and not thousands and not ten thousands. You had too many people yelling at you for something you didn't do. So here, you know, and, and what's going on? Moses dedicated his life for the welfare of every single Jew. Moses has no life of his own. His whole life is about the public, most public property. From day until night, he's at the, at the beck and call of Hashem and the Jewish people, and he's serving the Jewish people, and he's so humble. The Torah tells us he's so humble. And here, how many times did he save the Jewish people after they flubbed up with the, the golden calf and the spies? Anybody say thank you to Moses for all the time saved and pulled them out of the fire, pulled them right out of the fire? That Hashem said, you move aside, Moses, as if Hashem, Hashem, was, said, no, Hashem was testing Moses. And Moses says, no, Hashem, I'm not going to move aside. No, you've got to forgive him. You've got to forgive him. You've got to forgive him. So Moses pleaded on behalf of the entire nation, save their lives. Right? So here you've got someone that you saved their life so many times, and they're yelling at you and accusing you, not just not thanking you, but the exact opposite, ingrate. Well, you're not going to lose your patience? Not only do they not express a word of gratitude, but they accuse you of malicious intentions. You did a favor to, to your husband. You did a favor to your wife. You did a favor at work. You really stayed overtime trying to help the boss. And then they accuse you. No, you're standing here wanting you to rip me off. What are you, you, and this is crazy. This is so frustrating. So Moses is in front of this nightmare scenario of masses of people shouting at him and complaining at him, and throwing verbal insults at him, and, and accusing him of, of, of things he didn't do. Not accusing him of things he didn't do, accusing him of malicious intentions. Oh my goodness. Moses' malicious intentions? Why don't you accuse after uh, Mr. Klal Yisrael? You know what Hashem wanted to do after the golden calf? Mr. Klal Yisrael. You know what Hashem wanted to do after the Malaklim, after the spies? And it was not just, okay, the spies, they... They got the death penalty for speaking slander about Eretz Yisrael. I want to mention quite a few things about slander in tonight's lesson. But for these wrong accusations and malicious accusations, so you got all these people in your face, and they're not thanking you, they're accusing you, and they're accusing you of malicious intentions. You're not going to lose your patience? So in a split second of impatience, split second of impatience, I mean, if somebody's yelling at you, that maybe you got a dish in your hand, you're going to throw it, maybe, do something. You know, we, we all have, we all have our, our threshold, our patient's threshold. And Moses went way past an angel's threshold. And it's, okay, but Hashem told Moses, speak to the rock. So Moses, he can imagine what is his heart palpitating and, and all, there's all the millions of people yelling at him. And Moses he raises his voice back to credit. He lost his patience. He raises his voice. And he says, listen, please. <laughs> Shimona. He said, listen, please. This is Moses losing his patience. Listen, please. He speaks in a stern voice. Listen, please, you rebellious people. <laughs> he calls it this way. Yeah, he lost his patience. You're best people. From here, Moses is being accused of anger. This, for somebody else, is tremendous self control. No, but on Moses' level, this is what's considered anger. So... Moses says, do you think we can elicit water from a rock? Hashem promised. So Moses raised his staff, lost patience, and he hit the rock. We hit the rock once, and a little trickle of water came out of the rock. And then he hit the rock again, and the water came flowing forth. Well, wasn't that a big enough sanctification of Hashem's name? Moses brought water from a rock. And then Moses brought water. Well, 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 where is the, the lack of sanctification in Hashem's name? Moses, they think for an objective observer, Moses did a great job in sanctifying Hashem's name. Okay, hit the rock with his staff, boom, water comes out, and now there's all oh, this pool of water, great water and water gushing and gushing and gushing. There's more than they want. There's water for drinking and water for the cattle and water for whatever they want. And the water for their club, all their canteens and their barrels or whatever they want. Okay, no. Hashem commanded otherwise. Not talking about logic, not talking about Hashem doesn't want to hear my defense of Moses. Hashem has his commandment. Hashem's commandment was speak to the rock. Now, where is
is the lack of sanctification in Hashem's name. That people knew that Moses and his staff had special powers. The Gemara tells all about where Moses got his staff. Moses knew the secret word. The staff was like a tree buried in Yitro's garden, in Yitro's backyard in Midian. When Moses went to the desert, he got to eat, and nobody, nobody could see it. Yitro said, if somebody could pull that staff out of the ground, they could marry my daughter. And Yitro's daughters were gorgeous. They were beautiful. Uh, the, one of the most beautiful women ever lived was Sipporah, Moses' wife, Yitro's daughter. Okay, so Moses, he said a word of Hashem, and boom, pulled the staff right out of the ground, right out of the ground, and that's it. But, but people knew that that staff had special, it had special because it had Hashem's name on it, and they knew that the, Moses went to, he did miracles in Egypt with his staff, with his, his walking stick. Okay, so they knew it was magical, and they saw miracles being performed with it, but you remember, remember when the staff they threw it on the ground, the staff ate all the Egyptians, they, and Pharaoh and his soothsayers did the same thing. And Moses' staff ate up all their, ate up the snakes. Moses turned into a snake and ate up all their, their staffs also. But Hashem wanted Moses to speak to the rock. He wants to speak to the rock. You see, Hashem wants us to speak to the rock too. That way, nobody could attribute a miracle to anything other than Hashem. If Moses would have spoken to the rock, it would only be Hashem. Nobody could say Moses is thick, his staff is it's it's magical. <laughs> and it's a nice prop, you know. I didn't have, had, haven't had the flute in my hand for a whole year, and just for I didn't plan this, but just do what I needed. Need sampler. Moses' staff, his walking staff. Okay. Just when he needed it, that's it. Oh Hashem, thank you, Hashem. Okay. So despite the fact that from an objective observer, Moses inhibited unbelievable patience uh, unbelievable patience and fortitude and self-composure you know a kid can't stand up on him. three four people gang up on us five people gang up us but all the thousands hundreds of thousands of people gang up what is the intrinsic message here what is the intrinsic message moses on his level he took his stick and boom he banged the rock banged the rock and out came the water message here is Hashem wanted no activism at all. Hashem wanted only word of mouth, only voice. That's it. In hitting the rock, rather than speaking to it, Moses transgressed Hashem's commandment because Hashem said, speak to the rock. So even though the circumstances were beyond mitigating and beyond extenuating, and we could defend Moses in a million ways, no, that doesn't matter. Hashem expected Moses to believe that speaking to the rock, not hitting it with the staff, but speaking to the rock would bring the water out of the rock. That's what Hashem wanted. Okay. And Hashem said, Moses, you should have spoken to the rock. That's what you should have do. That's what I expected you to do. Okay, it's all the thing. And Hashem tells Moses something else. And this is on Moses' level. If you understand, more is expected of a football player in the Super Bowl than a football player in a high school game. Okay. More is expected on Moses' level of Amuna when he's been on Mount Sinai. He's learned Chavruta with Hashem three times for 40 days. More is expected of Moses than expected of someone else. We talk about lack of Amuna. We talk about lack of Amuna on our level. We're not talking about our level. We're talking about Moses' level. Moses is the greatest prophet that ever lived. Moses is the leader of Jewish people. Uh, the only one that will come near Moses will be Mashiach. Okay, where this is what the Gemara tells us that, but come near, we're not made, it's not a competitive game, like this is not the Super Bowl, this is Judaism, but nobody got near Moses until Mashiach. That's what we're waiting for Mashiach. Mashiach will be the leader of Jewish, Jewish people. Okay, so Hashem says to Moses, Moses, if your Amuna would have been perfect, you would have listened to me and you would have not hit the rock. And we can see what the Gemara says, Hashem that Hashem is exacting to the letter of the law, like a thread, like a hair thread with the tzaddikim. There's no, lean, no, no, no room for leeway. I'll give you an example. How does this work? If somebody's riding on the back of a donkey and makes a five-minute navigation mistake, then he goes two football fields out of his way. The donkey can go in a football field two and a half minutes, 
five minutes, two football fields, okay? 200 yards or 200 meters, whatever you like. What happens if an F-16 flying Mach 1-5 makes a five minute navigation mistake? The five minute navigation mistake in the F-15 is the difference between Haifa and Beirut. That's it. <laughs> That's a big, big mistake. The difference between Haifa and Damascus. That is a big, big mistake. So it's much different. Now imagine that Moses is in the Shema of an F-15, F not an F-15, F-35. Okay, so when Moses does something, Moses judged much, much, much more on a higher level, you could say severely, but it's on a higher level of judgment, higher standard than an average person, even an average Sadiq. So don't think that the stories of Torah are simple. Don't think that the lessons of Torah are simple. The lesson of Torah, this applies to each one of us this week's Torah portion, even though we're talking about something that happened 3,332 years ago. 3,332 years. That's not somebody what they have when Moses spoke, spoke to the rock. Okay, this is a message for each one of us, and I'll explain to you how. Hashem wants us to use our power of speech, and Hashem wants us to attain what we have predominantly by prayer. Hashem wants maximum spiritual effort and minimum material effort. We have to do basic effort. Okay, so a physician has to see patients, has to cure people. A plumber has to unclog drains. A carpenter has to make tables. But even so, the carpenter should think that his income comes from the table and the plumber should think that his income comes from being paid for the clock drain, and the doctor should certainly not think that his income uh, is derived from the, the money the patient sent him, or what the, the, the health services sent him. This, so we can see this now. We can see this now. Um, so many people, heaven forbid, are laid off, and so many people in the time, but I mentioned also a few things about current events, a very the Torah is alive today, it talks about current events. And if we could open up our eyes of Amuna, we could see how the Torah talks about current events. You see people that are laid off. And I'm in contact with many people that write me, they've been either on unpaid vacation or completely laid off, or their place of work has been closed down. And it's amazing that meanwhile, they still have food on the table. Meanwhile, there's still wine and chicken on the Shabbos table. What are they giving up on? The amenities. They're not eating in restaurants because most places in the restaurants aren't open. And they're not going to movies because movies are closed. And they're not paying money to go to uh, baseball games, Major League Baseball, because that's all closed down. So people are using their money. They're not wasting their money. Uh, but it's very difficult. I know for many independent people, many shop owners, but Hashem is showing us all. Hashem is showing us all that the Parnassa comes from Him and it doesn't come from anywhere else. It's not our business and not our work. And my blessing for everyone, for everyone, for everyone, that you won't lack anything you need. Hashem will give you everything you need exactly when you need it. And Bezalat Hashem for those, while I'm speaking, I'm praying for, for everyone, everyone should have had a good Parnassa. And those that are currently unemployed should get a great job very quick. But in the meanwhile, in the meanwhile, if you want to get a great job quick, take advantage of unemployment to add Torah time. Add Torah time. Say, okay, Shem, I understand the language. Add Torah time. Okay. Shem says, you understand? Good. Now you go back to work. Right. So Hashem wants us. Now, why do we do this? Hashem doesn't even work for your income. Hashem wants you to pray for your income. If you had to work, Say Parsha Daman every day. Say Parsha Daman. It, it's a meme. Say Hashem. Ask Hashem for all your needs. Speak to Hashem. Now, why, especially in North America, especially now with the coronavirus and the pandemic, people are suffering from extreme mood swings. Okay. Normally, even normal times, when people succeed, they're ecstatic. Oh, they're up. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest person on the block. I'm the greatest professional in this. But when they fail, they're crushed. What's wrong with me? How come I didn't make that sale? Real estate, how come I didn't have it sold a house in three weeks? What's going on with me? And he's down on himself. And now that you're down on yourself and you have a long face and you, you see a customer and get lack confidence in yourself, but customer then feels uncomfortable. 
But when you know it's not the customer and not the real estate agency and not your commission, it's only a shem. And you go, you're comfortable. You go, you got a smile on your face. You're charismatic and you make other people feel comfortable. And they're confident in doing business with you. It doesn't matter. This goes good for every business. For every business, no matter what you're doing. So we have to make our best effort in what we're doing. We make our best effort to do whatever we know how to do, whatever we do to make our living, and the rest is up to Hashem. But we have to know that we are powerless without Hashem. We can't do a thing without Hashem. And that's why Hashem wants us to speak to the rock. Who's the rock? Soul. One thing, the big rock had soul. Soul Mishalach Chalmu. It is a parable for Hashem. That's on the holy side. On the rock is another side. There's two sides to it. The Tzur is a Shem. That's a, the big rock, the boulder. On the other side, the rock is the obstacle. That's the Yitzhahara. The Gemara and Shratek Sukkah uses the rock as an example of the Yitzhahara. And he says if the, uh, our obstacles are, are, are a rock, the Yitzhahara is a rock, then our speech can knock it in and build like a sledgehammer, knock it into a tiny little pieces. So Sem wants us to speak to the rock. And once we speak to the rock, all the abundance flows forth. All the abundance, that's the water. That's the old, old Israeli folk song. And Moshe hit the rock and much, much water came out. That's the same thing. When we hit the rock, not with hit the rock, we speak to the rock. Okay, we speak to the rock and abundance flows forth. That's a spiritual law. And as see with the Muna, we know that our prayers can move mountains. The more we have a Muna, the more we pray. The more we have a Muna, the more we believe in prayer. The more we have a Muna, the more we can move mountains and we can accomplish the impossible. Just this, just this week, uh, a young woman, not gonna say where she is, a young woman, she was about to have a breech birth. In other words, right before she gave birth, the embryo was complete, the 180. The wrong, his head was in the wrong direction and it wasn't ready. And they were thinking that this has got to be a cesarean and she's got complications, certain blood complications and make a cesarean very dangerous. And Rabbi, what do I do? Got an you know. So I told her, speak to the rock. I speak to the rock and say, thank you, say nishmas. They said nishmas every day, she and her husband for a week, whoop, the baby did a 180. The baby did a 180. You can see, you can accomplish anything. Because prayer is above nature. When we hear things that were limited by nature, uh, someone says, no, with your uh, resume, I, I hate the shidduchim resume, but so with your resume, it's going to be difficult to find a shidduch. What are you talking about? That is total lack of amuna. All you need is one soulmate, and Hashem can give it to you right there with a snap of the fingers. Uh, with your resume at your age, it could be difficult finding a job. That is ridiculous, too. Because Hashem can not only give you a job, give you a job that better pay than what you had before. Wait and see. And it's not the salary, but again, you find all of a sudden, sometimes people make less money, but they have a bigger blessing to what they do. So this is being the rock. Okay. So with sufficient emuna and sufficient prayer, each one of us, each one of us, okay, uh, can bring that the makaru and any the layout. And Elaine Friedman and, and Gennady, everybody, and each one of you can bring water out of the rock. And you, can, you got the power. You got the power. Bo Hashem. So I mentioned before that people, if they, they hit the rock, that rock is like a sledgehammer. Have you ever seen a sledgehammer? A sledgehammer, you've got a handle, and you've got this big uh, five or ten kilo iron hammerhead, and it's two edged. You can hit with both sides. Speech is like a sledgehammer. It's got two sides also. It's got a side of holiness and it's got a side of the opposite. Now, if we really want to understand what the coronavirus is all about, we have to understand the principle of the sledgehammer. We spoke about the good side, the good side, the holy side of speech. The holy side of speech is when we pray, especially in personal prayer. And then we say Psalms and we talk to Hashem and we use our voice to learn Torah. But there is the other side. There is the other side that Hafez Chaim wrote a whole book about the laws of wholesome speech. And at least the laws of wholesome speech, but the Hafez Chaim said that the laws of slander. 
country. Look what happens with coronavirus. With coronavirus, we all walk around with our mouths muzzled. We go around mouth muzzled. We have walk around with a mask, muzzle. Okay, can't speak in speech. Number one. Number two, isolation and quarantine. That people that have been exposed to uh, bad virus, or in this case, bad speech, because bad speech is like a bad virus. Uh, the Gemara says so. The Gemara says it in about five places. Get isolated and quarantine, quarantine for 14 days. And the third is social distancing. You know, you had exact these three things in the Torah is the same three things that happened to a mitzvah, to a leper. A leper sent away completely social distance. He's quarantined. He's not allowed to speak to anybody. Why? Because Rashi explains that the leper's biggest sin was trying to separate between a man and a wife, between a friend and another friend by speaking Russian around about, about this one. Okay. And then there's a fourth element that anywhere you go is guilty. Bo Hashem and Eretz Yisrael now in Israel working hard to get this better, and that is talking in shul. There is not much greater disrespect of Hashem than talking in shul. And people come in the shul, and the middle of Shimon Isley, uh, they take out their smartphones, and they're answering text messages and looking at their WhatsApp. Can you imagine you're talking to the king? You say, excuse me, king, you don't interest me. Somebody just sent me a message, a chat, or a WhatsApp, or whatever. Biggest in front. Beloved brothers and sisters, don't take a telephone to shul. That, that the worst, the least of the worst evils is to turn it off. But don't take a telephone to shul. And whatever you do, whatever you do, the toys for Yom Tov, who lived during the terrible pogroms, it's called Xeros Tachvatat, in 1647 and 1648, a third of Ashkenazi Jewry was killed in pogroms. And the Tosfus Yom Tov lived in that time. He lived through it. Afterward, he made a prayer that we say Shabbat in the morning when the Torah scroll is open. We the Torah scroll is after we read the Torah portion. It's a Misha Be'erach, a special Misha Be'erach for anyone who doesn't speak in Shul. When you don't speak at shul, you get a special blessing. And you can understand that for someone that does speak at shul, it's bad news. It's bad news. So if we have difficulties in life, and we have inexplicable difficulties, people look up, Hashem, Hashem, what do I deserve this for? What's this for? Then chances could be that uh, disrespect of Hashem, looking at cell phones in shul, not turning them off, talking in shul, socializing, going to socialize with the shem. And that's a great thing, and especially in the shuls now, we're back in shul, but social distancing in shul, not people one on the other, you're on your own, dominates you and a shem, or Hashem. Okay, this is, and we'll see, we'll see. You have my blessing, and it's not my blessing, it's a sign check from the Chofetz Chaim, or the Dois Fis Yom Tov, and I give a whole list of other Chazal, uh, the Rabbi uh, Segal in Manchester, the Mashkiach in Manchester, he said, anybody that needs any kind of salvation, learn two laws of Lashon Hara a day. Chafetz Chaim says, anybody that accepts, just accepts a guarding tongue, doesn't mean you don't mess up once in a while, but if you accept Hashem, I hereby accept the mitzvah, of guarding my tongue, it's not just 31 mitzvahs involved in guarding my tongue, and just by acceptance and Hashem help me implement it, that already, the desire is already 50% of the of the goal, okay, and it's already a good chunk of a blessing, and folks, unbelievable divine blessing, that is the good side of the sledgehammer, okay, it can take the water out of the rock, the bad side of the sledgehammer is it can put a hole in a wall, and that's what they do, a hole in a wall. When there's a in the house, they take a sledgehammer to destroy that, that wall. And if, the, if the, the, the leprosy, there's leprosies in the walls, if it comes back after two weeks, then the whole house is destroyed. So a person could destroy the world or is it build the world. The water out of the rock, that's the divine abundance that we want to invoke for, for every one of us, every one of us. So I, before we start questions, I want to bless everybody, that everybody should have good health, 
and that uh, the coronavirus should be thrown on the, the worst creatures, the black widow spiders and the scorpions, but not for people. And that everyone should have adequate parnasa, good health and good parnasa, and that we all should have spiritual strength in Amuna and our love of Torah, our love of Hashem, and have a wonderful, wonderful Shabbos. And my blessing for Mama, Chasi Batkei, really by virtue of my mom, that's why we have these lessons. Uh, she came to the United States on the last boat out of Poland, right before the Holocaust. It was in a ghetto, but she was not in the camp. All right, and, but she came right here and uh, right before the last boat, even that boat that she came to America on, on the way back to Europe, the Nazis sunk it. That was the SS Podolsky. Okay, Bo Hashem, Mama, that she should have tiyad nishmatat suwa b'sua chayim, that her soul should be basking in divine light with the tzaddikim, the tzaddikot, and shomayim, amen. Okay, I'm open for questions about anything you want to ask, and don't be embarrassed. Okay, floor is open. Michael, let's go. I'm, here. I'm with you. Uh, for those who want to ask a question, feel free to hit the reactions bottom on the bottom. Raise your hand so I can uh, go ahead and unmute you so you can ask the question. Okay, yes, Sushi, got it there. You're on. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hey, guys. Um, Rabbi, thank you so much for taking time out every day to come uh, speak to us. I just wanted to ask a question. What would be, uh, I guess, one piece of advice you would give, or more than one piece, to to implement Muna into uh, every day, every scenario, situation in our lives? Okay, great question. Great question. So, uh, I'll give you a short answer. The long answer, we've got a book that answers that same exact question. You can get on Amazon, it's called Three Words of Amuna. Okay, so if you haven't read it, you can either get it in electronic form, get it on your phone, or you can get it in paperback form. It's a little book that you can carry around your pocket. All right, but I want you to remember three words of Amuna. I'm gonna give it to you standing on one foot, but then to, in order to, to really drive it into your brain, drive it into your heart, you know, okay, it's ain't od milvado. There's no one but a shem. When every uptight, when everything is something is strong, say hold the time out in the field, okay. If I'm the coach and you're my quarterback out on the field, right, and we're in a tough fourth down at the bottom of the fourth quarter, and I got two timeouts left, come on, I'm sidelines, let's, let's work our play. All right, so timeout is something legitimate. Hashem gives a timeout. When do we make mistakes? We do mistakes when we act impetuously without thinking. Okay, so the moment we feel a negative emotion, whether it's fear, whether it's stress, whatever you feel, okay, time out. All right, don't let the stress get a hold of you because there's a three second rule, not in basketball, a three second rule with the Yetzir Hara. Okay, the Yetzir Hara wants to knock you down. All right, so he says, there's no hope for you. And, and is it that, you know, grab it, and go hit somebody, go yell at somebody, go curse somebody, no, nope. time out. After three seconds, if you could do 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, take a deep breath. The answer loses. It's like a you put a pin in his balloon. Just goes right out. Okay. So you stop and think. First aid. This is first aid. Ain old milvado. Shem, there's no one but you. It's not him that's on my cage. It's not the boss that's on my cage. It's not my spouse on my cage. Not my neighbor. Nobody. Hashem. What's the message I need to hear? Okay, what's the message I need to hear? Hashem, remind me of my Amuna. Hashem, you gotta help me. Nobody else can help me, only you, only you. All right, so that's the thing. First of all, connect to Hashem. Get out of the situation, uplift yourself out of the situation, and you're in a crossfire. But just imagine, if you're down the infantry and you're a crossfire, all of a sudden you become invisible and you can rise up. This is what happens here, because as soon as you remind yourself Hashem, uh, you're not just sushi anymore. You're you're an angel. You're you're, you're putting your you're putting your neshama in, and your neshama is higher than an angel's. 
because your neshama has to overcome a body. Ain't you got the problem? Okay, you've got the, you've got opposition on the field. You've got heavyweight opposition on the field. So that's what you do first aid. Remember the three words of Muna. It works. It's great. Okay, there is nothing but Hashem. Ain od milvado. And he, in English, it's a little more. There is nothing but Hashem. It's five words in English, but three words. Ain od milvado. This is not my invention. This comes from Rabbi Chaim of Volozhin, who was a student of the Gaon of Vilna. Okay, you know, people think that, uh, you know, Muna, the, you know, the Amuna, 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 it's the breast of the dancer. No, no, that's just why Rabbi Chaim of Volozhin, we're talking about the hand of the, the Lithuanian world, the Yeshivish world, and just everybody. It doesn't matter who you are with your national religious, with the Kippah, without a Kippah. We all need a Muna. Everybody needs a Muna. Okay? Got you covered? I, I'm muted. You're muted now. I see it. Okay. Uh, Michael Sushi's muted. There. Wait, I didn't hear you. It's a volume. One second. Here we go. Yeah, he's it's already hard on mute him. I don't know what's going on. Here we go. Uh, Sushi, there, you're, you're now, I can hear you. That got me? Okay, good. Gotcha now. Okay, thanks so much. I appreciate it. What, what was the book called again? I just forgot. Three Words of Amuna. Three Words Google of Amuna. It and you find it on Amazon. Okay? okay. It's a little 105 page inspirational book and it's, uh, it's intravenous. Okay, thanks so much, Rabbi. I appreciate it. My pleasure. All the best. All right, the next one we have is Josh. Go ahead, Josh Bar On. Hi, thank you so much. Hey, Josh, how you doing? Thank you so much. I'm a big fan. I, I love the, the work you've done with Rav Arush. I really appreciate that. Of all the work you've done with Rav Arush. Um, my question is today, especially with COVID-19, what, what kind of emphasis should we have of seeking out Sadiqim and, and, and trying to find somebody who we connect to on a personal level? Okay. Uh, that is super important. You, you're talking about having your own spiritual guide, Josh. What, what's that? Say again? You're, you're talking about having your own spiritual coach, your own spiritual guide. A hundred percent. Okay. That is super, super important. And I'll tell you why I think, it, I think you realize the importance. It's a great question, but I'm going to elaborate on the question a tiny bit for everybody's benefit. Uh, there is a lot of similarity between an athletic coach, an athletic trainer, and a spiritual guide. Same thing. And, uh, you know, know from, from doing both, because I, I, I do both. Uh, same principle. You could be a champion athlete. I'm a champion, all right? But, Josh, if you can't see your strengths and weaknesses, then you're not going to go way above champion. That's your coach. Your coach sees your strengths and sees your weaknesses. In other words, suppose... You could be a mediocre 400 yard sprinter, but you'd be a champion 800 yard sprinter. Because maybe you're not the fastest guy in the world, but you've got a strong heart and strong lungs. And a lot of guys run out of gas at 450, 500. Okay. So with your physique and with your ability and with that, I'm going to train you to be an 800. All right. Uh, somebody broke down. Give me an example. Okay. A person that turns to be as a spiritual guide uh it's all broken that uh in coilil he wasn't succeeding in coilil and he, he was in, he was in the gomorrah eu in coilil an in-depth learning gomorrah coilil okay and i said the guy more practical i said you should be learning a halacha coilil all right and changed him and, and what part of halacha so moved him over to a coil the guy's doing great so rather than being mediocre in the Eon Koilo, because it, that is something that's very high prestigious in his circle. Okay, it should be, you know, strong in Eon. I said, no, you need to be strong in Torah. You need to be connected to a chef. All right, so why fight in the ring where you're going to get beat up? I want you to be the winner, okay? So move them over. This is your spiritual guide is so, so important. Now, finding one is super important. Josh, you need a guy that is going to understand you. All right, and there's something even more. You need somebody that the only one that's last stopped to Hashem is Moses. Unless you get to Moshe Moshe Rabbeinu. 
One of the most important things to ask about a spiritual guide is who is his spiritual guide? Who's his rabbi? Who's his rabbi? Who's his teacher? Uh, who qualified him? Uh, who, you know, this is some, you know, people walk, come up after the rain and, you know, they open up, uh, they, they, they start lecturing, they start doing this. They, who are they? What are they? You know, what, what, what do they stand for? Are, are they solid and not solid? Uh, who gives them asakoma? Who gives them approbation? Where do they learn from? This is very important. This is very, very, very important because if you learn from somebody solid and his rabbi and his rabbi and his rabbi, that takes you back to Moses. Because then the right chain, we're talking about the chain, Shashirat the Kabbalah, uh, the Rambam calls it in his introduction to the to Mishnayas about unconnected chain. And this is just as important with the Muna as is with academic Torah. Okay, so it's super, super important. So let's talk about some prime parameters you got to look for in a spiritual guide. We said, who's his Rebbe? Does he understand you? All right. Does he understand? You got to understand. Uh, a rabbi can take two people and give them complete opposite answers. Okay. Uh, one, I'll give you an example. Uh, how can one person smoke a cigarette on Shabbos and get gain them? Another person smoke a cigarette on Shabbos and get Canadian. All right. Okay. Take a brand new Balchuva on his very first Shabbos. And the guy's got a smoking problem. He smokes two packs a day. So 30, what is trouble? 39 cigarettes. He said no, and he broke on one cigarette. And even that he didn't finish. He took two puffs and threw it away. He's going to get ganated for that. All right. But then you get somebody who uh, doesn't believe, you know, just casually, uh, really maybe born in the program, but doesn't believe. And he smokes. And he didn't get the book thrown at him. Get gained him. So you see, as I, I'm talking in extremes, Josh, but this is how... You have to have different strokes for different folks, okay? And this is all, this is spiritual guide. Otherwise, we just all open up a shulchan aruch and finish. The game's over. Find out what the law is. But you know, inside a thing, you would, uh, you know, what's he? You got a guy wants to get married, uh, Rabbi. You think this girl's good for me? Uh, wants a dead job. You think his job is good for me? This career, the direction, you know, all kinds of things. All right. So this is, and the most important thing. We said the guy, the rabbi's got to this rabbi, he's got to understand you, he's got to be a Talmud Chacham himself, he's got to understand the intricacies, but more than anything, he's got to love you, Josh. Because if he doesn't love Josh Barron, then he's got no business, he's got to excuse himself. Uh, listen, I, I can't do it. Maybe you find yourself somebody else. Okay. Because if a spiritual guy cannot love it's like a commander you got to love your guys you got to love your guys because you're going to be at a place where maybe you got to put yourself in the line for them all right and it's very important example nowadays you know there's all kinds of crazy stuff in in, in judaism if sometimes you feel you know maybe a, a spiritual guide feels that his uh his student or whatever you want to call him that, you know maybe the guy's got money or something he's got your hand in your pocket no way no way, you don't want that. You want, I want, he care, all he cares about my neshama, he doesn't care about my bank, he doesn't care about anything I can do for him. Otherwise, that makes him, he, he's, he, he's, he can't be a spiritual guy because he's looking for you to influence him. As soon as I want something from you, I'm looking for you to influence me. This is the opposite of what you're asking me to influence you, okay? And this cannot be with a price tag. Okay, of course, I, we know, we all, we, we all contribute to our Rebbe as we all, we all do this. But if the Rebbe sticks his hand out and asks for it, that's, there's something with wrong with his Amuna. Okay, if we're talking about the Rebbe's going to teach you Amuna and he's going to ask you for money, <laughs> Rebbe, go ask for Shem. All right, this is it. Okay, that's a, a few things. If we, let, let's really, really quickly. We said that he's got to have his Rabbi. He's got to be bona fide and certified. He's got to love you. He's got to care about you, and he's got to put his own self-interest aside. That's standing on one foot, okay? Gotcha. My pleasure, Josh. Next question, Michael. God bless you, Josh. The next one is coming from Alan. Go ahead, Alan. I'm going to make a very short testimonial about, uh, in, in response to your question, Josh, uh, looking for a spiritual leader, uh, I have found 
the Rav as my spiritual leader, uh, and as well as my, you know, I go to him for Amuna. But if you're looking for somebody to help you, and it sounds like there's a good match from what I've heard, and, and if the Rav is willing to take you on, uh, I, I, I don't think there's a better person on this earth for you. Alan, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. You're, you're on your feet already? Uh, Alan Rafur Shlema for Avram Leib Ben Chayadina. Today he was in the hospital and he's out. Oh, Hashem, he's out. The, 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 you have the strongest heart in the world and success in the world. And it's so good to see you. Wow. Wow. It's so good to see you. I mean, I had a, I had a miracle performed for me today by way Thank of you, Hashem. Hashem. By way Thank of you, Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. And you. Thank you, Hashem. For Hashem. For Hashem. Anyway, uh, that's the thing. That, that's another one of the benefits, Alan, what, what uh, Josh, what Alan said, um, on, another responsibility, uh, you know, we're going to act this out, but if, uh, if a rabbi really loves you, really cares about you, and uh, he's your coach, then uh, you're going to be in his prayers. This is for somebody for real. You're going to be in his prayers. And we believe, we just spoke about it when we talk about prayer and, and this and that. I had... Because Alan is a special guy. Alan is a very special guy. And I've been walking around optimistic all day long that uh, it's going to be a great thing. And I got this lovely, lovely message from Alan's wife, Gina, that uh, it was a big thumbs up. So thank Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. He's more to the. Thank you, Hashem, that we see Alan. Alan, this is a big surprise. It's a lovely big surprise. And really started off my new year, coming off the year of mourning. And just just officially an hour and a half after morning, okay, after the year of morning. And this is just, thank you, Hashem. This is great, great, great news. Well, you got up today. Yeah. No, but it's for after the year. Yeah, I played my flute for the first time in a year. 11 okay. months. Okay. Celebrated with everybody. <laughs> good, good. Warm regards to Gene Allen. God bless. Next thank question, you. Michael. If anybody else has a question, you have your opportunity now, you hit the reactions button and raise your hand. We're gonna wait another 20 seconds. It looks like Sylvia has her hand up. She doesn't know how to do it on, uh, on Zoom, I think. Uh, Hold on. David. I want <clears throat> to thank you for this beautiful lesson. And it's a wonderful day to remember my dear and loved friend, Annette, which I lost a lot with her and with your dad. They were, this is the reason that you are the way that you are. Because <laughs> you have wonderful parents. I have beautiful memories from them and as we say in Yiddish they soll nom dem richtigen ganeiden und they soll sein gute beters amen and thank you very much and i have a question okay one second i just want to tell everybody who we're talking to this is something very special sylvia is shandelin that's my mother's cousin shandelin she's in mexico city okay and uh Hashem, mucho gusto as a as a machaya. Do we still handle it? Okay, but we'll talk in English. I, I love her, her Yiddish is it's like my mom's Yiddish. It's a flavor, the delicious flavor. It's like it's like the flavor of chunt on Shabbos. Okay. But go ahead, we'll talk English for for everybody benefit. Okay. What would you like to ask? I want to ask one of the things that I thank Hashem is that I was born with a lot of emune. And for me, Ani Mamin Bemuna Shlema, this is my hymn, my atikva. But, but lately, I have like a stone 
in my heart. And I don't know how to get rid of that stone. Okay, we'll do an open heart surgery right now. Tell, tell me about the stone, okay? okay? Good, surgery right now. Okay, that is a good idea. But really, I always thank Hashem for all the problems that I have because I learn a lot, but there are some problems that I give them to him and I help, ask him to help me. And I don't find any, any answer because every day it gets worse. So how can I, I do something like that? Okay, Shangle it. Listen to me, Tyra. Tyra Neshoma, Azat Tyra Neshoma. Shangle it. Hashem is a loving father. Okay? I know. Hashem, we call him in Yiddish, sweet father in heaven. Okay? Mm -hmm. Whatever your problems are, I want you to tell yourself, okay, tell you, look at the mirror and tell yourself, Shangle it. These problems come from my zisatat in Himmel. Okay? Ah, so Hashem, what happens? Hashem says, uh, Sylvia in Mexico City, she's got big problems. I know I gave it to her. But she's smiling. She says, calls me. She calls me sweet father in heaven with all these problems. Now I'm going to give her more reason to call me sweet father in heaven. And the problems go away. Rather, than this. Okay, listen, I'm not asking you to act like you smoke marijuana or there's sick substance and this and that, like you're stoned. Do not deny the pain. Do not deny the pain. Because Hashem, tip me away. Tip me away out. Hashem, it hurts, it, it, it hurts my heart. It, it hurts me. Hashem, I have pain. Hashem doesn't want you to be a liar. Shangle, don't deny the pain. Don't deny the pain. But you say, Hashem, I know this pain is coming from you and you're a father in heaven and it's Kapoor and you're a sweet father in heaven because there's some people, Nebuch, Nebuch, Nebuch. You want something? Shangle You still have your good looks. You still have your health. You still have your brains. That's one of the blessings that mama had until 48 hours before she died. She had a clear brain. At 93, it was a, mm -hmm. right, right before her birthday. She had a clear mind, clear brain. It just, but the last, the, the last two weeks, she went back into Grodno. She went back into Poland, and she only spoke with Yiddish. She went back into the grass. All I can see, all the America went away from her, and she went back to the to the old country. Okay, she only spoke Yiddish, but outside of that, that was the last two weeks. The last 48 hours, she was out of it, okay? But that's it. And Bo Hashem, and Hashem give you a clear brain. I know you're going to have a clear brain to 120, okay? I know you have your issues. I pray for your issues. I pray that Hashem should give you a refuah, and Hashem should help you feel good, and Hashem should give you nachas, and Hashem should give you a big smile, all right? So tell Hashem, yeah, Hashem, it hurts me, but I know it's from you, my zisatat and himmel. And this is going to work for you, big wonders, and you let me know, okay? Von dein Moil in Gott Zeugen. Gleich, gleich. Express flight, express flight. Okay. Shaitla said, from, from your mouth to Shem's ears, and I say express flight. Puch Hashem. Okay, Shaitla, Zyke Bench, be healthy and, and, and uh, warm. Avam and Gris to Jorge. Warm regards to Jorge. Okay, and Bukhashem. Okay, Michael. Okay. And, uh, you, and you said about the last days of your mother. I was very lucky because I spoke with her. I used to speak to her every week. And on the last days, she always answered me the phone. I don't know if you remember. Bukhashem. And Good. it was Not difficult just... for her to speak. Okay, yes. Michael, we got, okay. we got another Thank five you so minutes. Much. Thank you, Shadow. Another five minutes. Whoever we have wants one to more do. question. Uh, time for one more, and we're going to put on uh, Frank Morris here. Go okay. ahead, Frank. Hey, 
Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, Frank. Okay. <laughs> uh, after listening to that, uh, it kind of like I'm not sure <laughs> what direction I'm going to go because it kind of goes along somewhat. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, a gentleman gave me uh, the Garden of Amuna. Uh, I lived in California. I was not religious. Uh, I wasn't brought up in a J Jewish home. I was brought up in a Christian home. And after reading the Garden of Amuna now three times, uh, my journey is uh, Rabbi Brody is uh, in, an, in, in a direct way. He might not know it uh, personally, but because I've never met him. But um, my loss, Frank. Yeah. Uh, because that inspiration uh, in there brought me t to who I really am. Uh, it just. Uh, it's been a very, very hard uh, kind of semi-independent because I don't live in a Jewish community. Uh, at the time when I got married, I was, I didn't know I was Jewish. And so this battle, when I say battle, but the, the person that uh, I've talked to when you were at, at Breslev uh, shared with me a statement and the comment was made, don't, don't think about where you were, think about where you are now. And listening to many shears of yours, Rabbi Brody, uh, it was like hearing it from you. Uh, it's just my passion uh, to follow Hashem. Uh, many fumbles, many, you know, situations, but so to get back up and to continue. Let me, Frank, let, let, me, let, me, let me make you really feel good about yourself. Really feel good about yourself. Okay. Uh, the commander in chief is summoned by the defense minister and the prime minister. And they have a special secret mission behind enemy lines that only the very best commando can do. Now, there's certainly, I think, a run-of-the-mill infantry soldier and certainly not a driver or a mail clerk. You take the best commando in the Army. Frank, with your background, you were thrown behind enemy lines, far away from holiness, didn't even know you were Jewish, and for you to do what you did so far, and you're going to do a lot more, uh, this is a commando in enemy lines. Now, why does the commander-in-chief pick you? because he knows that you're going to make it back. And Hashem took your neshama and threw it behind enemy lines because he knows you're going to make it back and you're on the way back big time. And what you are spiritually, you are Medal of Honor material, Frank Morris. It's a privilege to know you. Well, uh, from, from my heart to, uh, to yours, yeah. again, um, reading so many different materials, hearing many shares that have sparked, again, uh, so many things in my life. Um, uh, you know, I could go on and on, but I just, uh, I think, I thank Hashem that, yeah, he, he pulled my heart and pulled my, my <laughs> neshama to, to come, come back home. Uh, uh, again, fumbling falling but that's all good because i you know um uh, i just say i gotta keep on going i can't stop i can't stop okay so. that's good anyway Jim, bless you we gotta we gotta uh cut the lesson a little bit short i mean, i could go on and on but uh michael's got a lot on his plate and so do i uh michael with your permission once again i'm gonna bless everybody including you brother michael Michael Ben Melech and the whole Lighthouse Project, uh, Lighthouse Torah Project staff, uh, for being the host to our weekly Wednesday Shur. And I say it every week, but this is really a highlight and a highlight. And I'm so delighted to partner with the Lighthouse Project 
There are a lot of people, good people, working in Jewish outreach and care roof, this and that. Uh, the Lighthouse, not to take away anybody else's privilege, but uh, they're up in the top five. They're the very best. Michael, you should have continued success. And on a personal level, okay, for everything you do for Kla Yisrael, Hashem should give everything you need for yourself because Michael is really devoting so much time that he could have a lot of things doing his own business, his own family, and he's giving it to Kla Yisrael. That is big stuff. And all of you, everybody's there with your good health and tons of nachas from your children, the ones here, the ones on the way, those these soulmates get soulmates, those that don't have children should have children, those that need good parnosa, good parnosa, those that need health, refuah, should have refuah. Whatever you need, all your heart's wishes for the very best. And God bless, warmest regards from here in Eretz Yisrael, the Holy Land of Israel. God bless. I hope to see everybody next week. Michael, take care and warm regards. Thank you, Rabbi, so much. Everybody have a wonderful day. If anybody's interested for future classes to sponsor Rabbi Brody's class, it's going to go on lighthousedonations.com. That's lighthousedonations.com. And you can check on his name and, and go ahead and put all the information. That's very easy to do. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a wonderful night and a wonderful day. God bless.